Nice to welcome you. I don't know if you hear me. I hear you. Thank you. Yes, no, I can't see you for the moment. I don't know if you see the screen, you see Marcus S. Clibris. We couldn't find in, in Harvard, but we finally found it in, in France. Hi. Now I see you, Mary. So I'll just say a, a few words to tell who you are. So actually, uh, I, I, can I speak in English or in French? In English, it's okay. Okay, so, so Marie, he's, uh, she's actually in the library. Uh, uh, Marcou and Agassi founded in, in 1860s. So this is funny that the first time I came to, to Harvard, I came across you, Marie, uh, and Jim Hanken. Jim was the previous director of the Museum of Comparative Zoology, which once again was founded by Agassiz and Marcou. They are, they are both of them. They are their successor. <laughs> So thank you very much. And Mary was the first, and Jim too, to answer my first questions. For the first time I understood how important it was Marku. I sent her some emails and she found a lot of things she's going to present you this afternoon in the place where we were uh, one year ago, discovering everything on Marku. Like at the Société Géologique de France, we have not exactly the same books but partly the, the same books. That was funny that I found these books in Harvard and then in France, secondary, in a way. So like the, the Rifa di la Tata I found recently in the Museum of uh, Natural History. So thank you very much. And uh, uh, as you, I don't know the, in English, the microphone. There is a specific word. I hold you the microphone, right? Thank you, Marie. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. In, in, Merci. In, the, in, in the group, we have a, one person you will meet in, in October, Faustine. Faustine, she's the biology teacher of the group of girls we are going to take to Harvard in, in October. So she's in, in the room with us. Maybe we, she can say hello to you a little bit later on. Thank right. you very much. Thank you very much, Daniel, and a welcome uh, all of you to the Library of the Museum of Comparative Zoology. It is now Ernst Meyer Library, mm -hmm. named for our director, Ernst Meyer. But in the 1860s, it was Agassi and Marcuse Library. And I will start my slides. We have heard so much about Marcu in France and the world. Now we will hear Marcu in America. So we start his exploration and impact. Marcou was in America mostly an explorer, also an author. I should also say I uh, greet you from myself, the staff of the library, and also for Professor Hankin. Professor Hankin is traveling this week, but he has contributed to this presentation. We will talk about his early years, which you already know, you've reviewed this and his meeting with Agassiz, his exploration of the new world of North America, and Marcus's work and its legacy at Harvard and in the world. Of course, you know, Marcou was born in Salin, and in 1845, he published his first work in the Memoir de la Société d'Histoire Naturelle de Neuchâtel, edited by Louis Agassiz. Of course, and we have this in the library right behind me on a table. And his meeting with the Agassiz was part of him coming to America, we believe. Of course, he served first as professor of mineralogy at the Sorbonne, and then began his fellowship as the traveling ge geologist in the Jardin de Plantes. Marie, can, we yes. share can you share your PowerPoint with us? Ah, I thought it looks to me like I shared it. We're having a technical difficulty. Yeah, we, we have it. Uh, actually, we have it here. That's Should I go back? You can't see it in, in, on the screen. Ah. Oh. 
je sais pas qui je regarde. <rire> je suis vraiment pas un homme de ce truc-là. Tu le veux parce que je l'ai en... en clé, moi. Normally, you, you could share it. Oh, sorry. Normally, you could share it with us. Yeah, on, on the Zoom, it says I'm sharing. Can, can you see? Can you stop sharing and do it again? Okay, I, I've tried to share again. That's good. It's fine. Is, this is good. Ah, is, is we've got it? That's okay. If you can see, I will start again. The presentation by myself and James Hanken about Marku and America. We review his early years and meeting with Louis Agassiz, exploring the new world and also Marku's work at Harvard and out in the world. Of course, you know about Marku in his early years He was born in Salin and educated at the, at the Lycée and at the College Saint Louis. Uh, in 1845, he published the Recherche Géologique sur le Jura Salinois in the journal published by Louis Agassiz. And this, we believe, was how he met and became friends with Louis Agassiz. 1846, he was professor of mineralogy at the Sorbonne. And this is why he is always referred in American literature as Professor Agassiz. Uh, no, as Professor Marcoux, excuse me. <laughs> He's Professor Marcoux because he was professor first. He did not teach at Harvard, but he was always referred to as professor because he was professor in Europe. In 1847, he started as the traveling geologist from the Jardin de Plant. In 1848, he arrived in the USA. Now we talk a little bit about uh, Agassiz, who came two years before Marcou. You see him in the portrait with the glacier. He was the uh, premier. He developed the ideas of glaciation and the ice age. So he was known for that in Europe before he came to the US. So it appears in his portrait. And on the other side, we see him at the classroom. He was a dynamic speaker and an acclaimed teacher in the United States. And also, of course, the founder of our museum. But this is still 1840s and um, museum was not until 20 years later. Here is our museum when it was new in 1859 and then 1872. So Marku, we will hear more about when he arrived, but in the 1850s, 60s, 70s, He is arranging the fossils. He is bringing back fossils for the museum, traveling all over the North America and bringing back fossils and working with the scientists at the museum. Primarily, we, we remember Marku as an explorer and a collector. 
and he he came in a time in the mid 19th century when the Americans were thrilled with the beauty of nature. So Jim has put in many slides of the beautiful paintings of nature from the same era when Marcou was exploring. So we have our first artwork, Natural Bridge by Frederick Church. Now we're back to Agassiz. Agassiz and Marcou were both very idealistic. They had these grand thoughts and Agassiz, I will just read it. My great object is to have a museum founded here, which will equal the great museums of the old world. We have a continent before us for exploration, which has as yet been only skimmed on the surface. My earnest desire is to put our universities on a footing with those of Europe or even ahead of them. Okay, here we have Marcou's major expeditions. He, he did many more expeditions that they were smaller, took less time. These are the big ones that I will discuss today. When he first arrived, he went with Agassiz to Lake Superior in the uh, northern Midwest and also through Niagara Falls along the border between the United States and Canada. In 1853, he was part of a large Pacific Railroad survey with the U.S. Army surveying the North America west of the Mississippi River, where they traveled from the Mississippi River all the way to California to survey a possible railroad route to the Pacific. In 1875, his last major expedition was with another government group, the United States Geological Survey, their explorations west of the 100th Meridian, all the way to Southern California. And Marco reported in, on the Southern California rocks. Here's from his earliest one. Within weeks after arriving in the United States, Marcou joined the expedition to Niagara Falls and then on to Lake Superior. It was the first exploring expedition to Lake Superior. And again, this is the, the publication that tells about Marcou and the rest of the people on the, the voyage. And we have a copy on the table behind me and I can share more about the publications. I'm a librarian, so I love these publications. And Jim has also put in a map of where these expeditions are happening. So first he's going from the Easter coast up through Niagara to Lake Superior and then the rest of the expedition went on farther west. Marcou stayed and gathered more fossils and more artifacts in Michigan along Lake Superior. And when I visited Michigan, they remember him and this expedition very well. So this is his first geological map of the United States, 1853. And you can see it is not the United States that we know today. It is you know, of the moment. And also we have this map on the table behind me. So after I finish speaking, I can show you the table. This we have the map from the Grand Expedition. I need to flip my pages here. The route of the Pacific Railroad Survey in 1853 and 54. And Daniel will remember we made a big banner for the exhibit in uh, 2022. It was uh, 2,900 kilometers from the Mississippi River to California, to the Pacific Ocean. And it took them nine months from July 1853 to March 1854. It was a monumental expedition for our country in America and also for Marcou as the geologist. They started out at Fort Smith, Arkansas. And all of these illustrations are from this large volume I have on the table, the report of this expedition. There's many volumes um, and it beautifully illustrated. So here they are on the Mississippi River 
starting out from Fort Smith in July. And next at the Valley of La Cuesta, Rio Pecos. And we see the gentleman here. One of them maybe Marco? This was called the Whipple Expedition. Uh, Emil Weeks Whipple was the leader and it was a good friend of Marpu, especially by the end of the expedition. We have letters between Whipple and Marpu, which are, are, are very dear. So we see them going west and again, Jim has put in this map with the arrows so we know where we are. Heading west from the Mississippi towards the Pacific. And next, snow in the mountains of New Mexico. And these are gentlemen in, you know, their regular clothing on horses. It was cold and they were camping and observing all of they could over these thousands of miles. And this is a sort of thing that Mark who loved the most, these geological formations, the Pyramid Mountain in New Mexico, And did he find Griffea? We think he did. He is collecting all along the way, as well as drawing and making notes. And here we have campfire along the Aquarius range in Arizona. So coming further west and the, the landscape changes and we see they're in a rugged campsite And we continue west. They also encountered, of course, the Native Americans, the American Indians. So we hear the Zuni, Indian altar and ruins in New Mexico. So this was, uh, we have a separate section in this volume of reports just about the people they met and the languages and the objects. And this was all very new to the um, Americans as well as to, to Marco. And we see the, the Western, the Anglos in their, their clothing and the Indians in his garb. And next, the Navajo in Arizona. Every, of course, the different groups were um, looked different and were dressed differently. And next, the Mojave in California. And here, examples of the artifacts that they were collecting and they were trading with these uh, Native Americans for these objects and bringing them back to Cambridge and to, uh, to the rest of the country, but we do have some of them here, you will see in a moment. And here we have, of course, the official government report and Jules Marcoux's notes. The resume and field notes, which are very detailed about this whole voyage starting in Arkansas and ending in California. Now his next map of the geology of North America in 1858, it's only five years later, but now North America, the map, the United States, this is what we recognize. The progress between the 1853 map and the 1858 map is dramatic. And also we have, we have the map here on the table behind me as well. As Daniel said, we cherish uh, many publications by Marku, both the maps and, and the books. Next, I have some small excerpts from his later expedition, again, a government trip. This was the west of the 100th meridian, again, a few years later, 30 years later, really, 
again surveying the Western states. And in volume three, for the first time, we see there's a, a prepo preposi proposition to name Marku Buttes out in the West. And then also we have Marku's report on the rocks of Los Angeles. Now I come back to campus to where we are here and the history of Marku at my museum. So here we have the museum. It's expanded beyond its original four rooms to a much larger building. It is looking like the modern place where we are now, circa 1880. In 1859, when the museum was new, Marco was here helping to uh, begin the museum and arrange the fossils. He led the paleontology department and he was also our first librarian. He organized the museum library assisted by Alexander Agassi, the son of Louis. So here we have notes from the annual reports of the museum. From 1861, it tells how a private subscription came up to form our library, made of donations from de Koning and from others. Honorable Charles Sumner. And at that point, the library had more than 6,000 volumes. And then two years later, the report states directly that Professor Marku has been engaged during the past year in arranging the books according to their subjects and in making catalogs of the different alcoves. Then we had not a separate library space in 1863, but in the, the um, scientific rooms, there were alcoves full of the books, which were arranged by Agassiz and by Marcou. Agassiz made an alphabetical list and Marcou made catalogs by subject. Now we have a few years later, in 1888, we have two official rooms for the library down here and across on the other side of the wall is geology and paleontology. And the, the rooms where marked paleontological subjects, this is where I'm speaking from now. This area is now part of the library. In 1888, the um, building is still growing. Alexander Agassiz and his colleagues are raising the fund and building more sections of the library building laboratories and classrooms, as well as galleries for the exhibits. And here we have a letter from 1888 from Alexander Agassi. They began working together at the beginning of the museum, but they maintained a lifelong friendship. So uh, Alexander is thanking uh, Marcou for a tableau that he donated to the museum. And he also apologizes for not seeing him lately. Alexander Agassiz also traveled extensively, mainly ocean voyages. Also, he had a home in Newport, Rhode Island. He was not very often in Cambridge and he apologizes uh, for not seeing Marcou more often. Marcou at this point in the 1880s was in the United States full-time and had a house in Cambridge nearby the museum, a short walk away from the museum. And I wanted to include this because Alexander says, um, that he was sorry to miss his most, his, his most intimate personal friend is how he refers to Marku. And I thought this was important to share that they were colleagues, they were friends, that the, even though Marku was not an official employee of the museum for many years. He was always involved in the work of the museum and with his colleagues there. And here we show, this is Jim's photograph of the paleontological gallery in Paris. And we compare it to our museum, which is 
how it looks today, it's very much like it was in Marcuse era also. And here today, this is how the museum is looking when uh, Daniel visited last year. And also many of our specimens, the specimens that Marcou uh, delivered to the museum are now in this modern brick building in the paleontological collections. The, the museum collections are now spread over the historic building, has the public galleries, and many of the uh, scholarly collections are in the modern building in secure modern storage. And here we have, of course, uh, Professor Daniel and Professor Hankin uh, in the room where I am, looking at the maps. And these blue notebooks, which you see on the table, these are called Marcou. We have named the Special Collections Catalog after Marcou because he was the one who organized our library. And we still use them. You know, these records are in the general catalog for the library system, but these notebooks are the best way to find things. The museum, of course, also has Marcus fossils. And we were delighted to show Daniel at his visit the original fossils from Salin that he has uh, donated to the museum here both in the drawer and then the detail. We have Griffia. We are delighted to unite the Jura and Salin with Cambridge. Also, we have a portrait collection here. We don't have the original plaque, but we have a wonderful photograph of this plaque of Jules Marcou by Max Claudet. And Danielle tells me that Claudet is also from Salam. The portrait collection is another strength of the library and the archives of the museum. Of the, the hundreds of contributions that Marcou made to the museum, all of them are fossils except for this one antelope, we have one mammal skull, the pronghorn antelope from the Pacific Railroad Survey, collected by Mark in the Rocky Mountains. So when he, he has the Rocky Mountains in his book plate, it is real. He, he traveled extensively in the Rockies several times and we have the benefit of his collecting. Also at our, our sister museum, we, at the Peabody Museum nearby has archeological and ethnological specimens, including the Native American objects that Marcou brought back. From the Lake Superior expedition, the first one where he was with Agassiz and went to Lake Superior after Niagara. And the color is still beautiful and sharp. And they, it is on display in our museum, in the Peabody Museum, our sister. And the Mojave, we have it in the reports, in the illustration, and then again also in the public galleries. The clay doll and the bark shirt or skirt. We don't know how they wore it, but it was an article of clothing uh, brought back by Marcou and now still on display. Marcou, as you know, published extensively, both in English and in French, in America and in Europe. Um, one of his key Contributions here is this first full length biography of his friend Louis Agassi. It is a two volume work uh, done in great detail, and we still, I, I as a librarian, rely on it for 
or historical questions, because of course, Marcoux knew Louis Agassiz well and spoke from scholarly sources, but also from his personal experience. And the book is now reissued in 2013. So it's a historic book and also a modern book and a lasting legacy of Marcoux for the public, not just the scholarly community. And we have Marcoux as a place name now. We heard about Marcoux Buttes from the 1875 report, Marcoux Mesa in the Navajo County in Arizona with this aerial map. So his name is still in our country, on our country. And there we go, the label Marcoux Mesa. and an aerial view. And we know this, um, the, the group of students and, and the teachers from the high school will be visiting and I cannot wait to meet them. And I would love to hear the, how they enjoy the Marco Mesa. You're just outlining the, the structure of the Mesa. And now we are back to the artwork. We've seen the, the kind of primitive illustrations from the expeditions, but there were so many wonderful paintings of these works that they seized the public imagination of the United States. The, the wonders of Niagara Falls, it's vast and it was you know, unlike most people had ever seen. So the expression in painting is exuberant and so beautiful and we wanted to share them with you. And again, an artistic view as opposed to the historic um, illustration from the, it's not a government report. This is the painting with the beauty of the Rocky Mountains. At the same time that uh, Marku and his expedition were, were traveling there. This is a warmer illustration. The Valley of the Yosemite. Ah. Valley of the Yosemite coming back, even warmer light. And you see the wildlife. Of course, Marco and the Pacific Railroad Survey crossed the Sierra Nevada. They came through here in 1853 and 1854. And we will finish the artwork with something closer to you all, Le Roche Pruy by Gustave Courbet, 1864. And we have reason to believe that this figure in the shadow is actually Jules Marcou. But it, the experts in the room there will know more than I do. And to finish, we have our Professor Daniel Reichwey at the Marcou gravesite. It's again, not far from the museum, a few miles. And we have uh, Marcou's gravestone, the Ammonite and his wife beside him with an acorn, Ms. Uh, Jules and his wife, Jane Marcou. And this is the end of my slides. Let's see. So if um, I've not filled my hour, but I can show you more of the, the objects. Yes, feel free to show extra objects and specifically the room where you are. Yes, it is a, a oh, beautiful okay. historic room. No, no, no. Sorry, um, I'm always mistaken from this thing. Um, oh, okay. So we we go to the, the modern, the Marku notebooks that we still use. We have not finished to explore Marku's life in France and in, in the US, specifically all the these type of books, for example, the books you have of Marco records of the 1850s. So it should be interesting to see what you have, what we have here, and, and to understand the way Marco was working, with which books he was working. Yep, and here we have, I'm sorry about the camera angle. We have his book, Geology of North America, and this enormous map. Oh, apologies for the camera. Oh, ah. oh no. Yes. Oh, there we go. 
With Marku, you have enormous maps. And also, his wife's family, they were also map makers. I can do more detail on that in the future. But here we have the earlier map, which is physically larger. The country was smaller. And then the later map. And our, our beautiful room with the historic cases. And I don't know if you can read any of the detail, but it's the first publication by Marcou in Neuchâtel. Actually, that's why the first time I read this book. Oh, <laughs> wonderful. Right here at the Société Géologique de France, but I went to Harvard <laughs> to read this book. <laughs> I'm sorry, Solette. <laughs> I should have known you before. And over here, we have the original of the map of the expedition. But it, it, the table isn't long enough for the whole map. And we have Lake Superior and the biographies of Agassiz. Actually, a lot of things are, if you, you we can get it on, on, on the website now. The, the yes, yeah, we can get one. many things uh, on the uh, website. Across another American man, I didn't know they were relative or friends, David, Henry David Thoreau. This is oh, okay. one of the last uh, discoveries I made in, in, I guess, his life. Thoreau, the Walden, uh, the famous Thoreau, was professor in Harvard. One well, was in Harvard at the same time. And uh, if I understood well, uh, I guess he or Thoreau gave, uh, Thoreau gave, I guess, I guess he's a, a dog. He wanted, didn't want to take with him in the forest. So there is something strange I have to, to figure out. But they, they they knew each other. That means Thoreau and Marku knew each other. But this recent uh, one month and a half, maybe, uh, Jim um, took me some 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 sentences from I guess his book where he speaks about Thoreau. I mean, uh, Marku speaks about Thoreau too. So we have to find uh, more, more clearly uh, the relationship between these three people. I guess he Thoreau and and Marku. Yep, we will work on it. Yeah, the, the, the Francophone community was very close, so there there will be more to find. And the, the second uh, discussion we can have is about Jenny Belknap. Uh, Jenny was quite rich, and um, I think it's her, her uncle was a publisher. So he, he published a lot of things Marku wrote. But we have to understand that it'd be better who was Jenny. I think this is one thing we have to figure out in the in next month. Jenny was uh, probably a very interesting person to me. Yeah, she was. She was a very private person. There is very little written about her, but she did write a full biography of her grandfather, Jer Jeremy Belknap, and she was, you know, obviously very well educated, well spoken, but we have very few clues about details of her. What is funny is that in many, not biography, there are not many uh, Marcus biography, but in on Wikipedia page in France, we uh, we can read that uh, Jenny Belknap is the uh, daughter of Jer Jeremy's, Jeremy Belknap's daughter and not grand. Ah, she's the granddaughter. Yeah, there's a typo. I to correct that. I don't know if I can It's, do it's that. two generations. To change this. And what is funny that now, uh, very recently, I came across with a second Jenny Belknap. Uh, I'm work, working on internet, and there is another Jenny Belknap at present, and she's uh, vice president of Estee Lauder. You probably know Estee Lauder. The, hmm. So by chance, I know someone, uh, I know the, 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 the former president of Estee Lauder, so I asked him if I can be in touch with uh, Jenny Belknap too. And Jenny Belknap too, so I started a discussion with her, and especially with her father, Michael Belknap. He's from Boston. He's a lawyer, and he's working on Jenny Belknap's number one book. So probably, uh, but he's in he's off America at present, so he, he can't talk to me a very long moment on on, on net. So he has not. He's he's just have his phone. So we are in touch. This is probably a track we have to follow. If ever we have found someone from Belknap family uh, still alive, I don't know the relationship between Jenny Belknap number two and Jenny Belknap number one. 
the only thing I know that Jenny Bellam number two does know anything about Jenny Bellam number one. She just mm -hmm. knows that her father is writing a book about Jenny about Jeremy Belknap. So ah. follow okay. this this track. So you know, someone working on Estee Lauder has probably nothing to do with history, except through her father. <laughs> So we probably know, 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 have some news within the near future. Have Wonderful. you any question, maybe? Or just, I, I think yeah. everybody wants to go to Harvard. Yes, I, I have a question, Marie. Uh, Pierre, uh, Pierre, Pierre, if you, we say... Um, Pierre, Pierre, Pierre Savaton, you, you know him, there's Pierre, he's of the Coffrigeo, French. Hello. So uh, you know him by, by email. Bonjour, Pierre. Uh, we, we say Marco is a great geologist in, in, in French. He is a great American geologist. Uh, he was professor in Harvard. But uh, is it because of his friendship with Agassi or because he, he have a, a great reconnection for the uh, overall American geologist? Uh, I see. Yeah, no, sorry. I think both. Yeah, um, he... The, the friendship with Agassiz was important, but also um, Mark, who was part of the Boston Society of Natural History, American Academy of Natural Sciences, he had uh, connections with others as well. So he, he, he um, it was not only Agassiz, but also the connections with other geologists. And he, he also engaged in, in controversies and in, in debates with other geologists. Uh, there was the, the tectonic system controversy, which I, I didn't go into in the talk, but it was there's a lot published on tectonic system, uh, which was you know, controversial in, in America in the 19th century and, and even in 20th century. But Marco wrote extensively and engaged in a lot of debate with the other geologists. Okay, thanks. No further questions? So uh, I just want to introduce you, Marie, I just want to introduce you to two people here. Faustine and Solène, if you can come on the right. Hi, Mary, nice to meet you. So Solène is the, in charge of the library here of the French Geological Society. So just come closer, please. Hi, Mary, nice to meet you. So Solène. Hi, Solène. You're between touch, I don't know. You are in touch. Yes. Probably have something to exchange. <laughs> I, I enjoyed them thoroughly before even the oral presentation. Thank you very much. And you were Thank you, Solen. And Faustine? Hi, Mary. Nice to meet you. I'm Faustine. I'm biology and geology teacher in um, Maison d'Education de la Légion d'Honneur in uh, Saint Denis near Paris. And she will be coming in in October with the group. Or oh, the group will be coming with her, and I'll be coming too. But uh, I'm very uh, pleased that you can welcome us. We have to to be a little bit more clear about the agenda. But this is for yes. the next week, as soon as Jimmy is back. Thank you very much. Thank you. So wonderful to meet you, Faustine. Merci. Thank you.